Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and a CLL patient myself, Chief Medical Officer, Executive Vice President of the Nonprofit CLL Society. Jeff? Hi, thanks, Brian. It's so great to be here with you today. My name is Jeff Sharman. I'm a practicing hematologist oncologist in a community-based practice in Eugene, Oregon. I serve as the medical director of hematology research for a larger organization called US Oncology. And uh, I've been involved in um, CLL clinical drug development for the last 15 years and, and uh, been a great pleasure to see a number of these, these uh, therapies that we're working with today and talking about today, really from the very earliest days. And we may have another new exciting drug to be talking about as an approved drug in CLL. At this point, it's approved in other therapies, uh, other lymphomas, but not yet in CLL. So it can be used, quote, off-label. Uh, and that's Xanabrutinib. And you uh, were involved in research on a very important paper about this. One of the big issues with this class of drugs and the ones that are well-known are ibrutinib and acalabrutinib is not how efficacious they are. They work great, but people can have trouble tolerating them because of their side effects. So this trial was looking at those things. Can you explain what the design of the trial is, why you put it together, and a little bit about mm -hmm. the results in a patient-friendly way for us, Jeff? You bet. Happy to do that, Brian. So, uh, you know, one of the sort of offhanded comments I frequently tell patients is that uh, pills don't work if they stay in the bottle. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of the idea that if you're not taking your meds, they, they're not going to work. We have been so uh, fortunate in CLL that really some of the fundamental biology questions have been answered uh, with therapies. So the BTK inhibitors, BCL2 inhibitors, these are really um, two of the most important biomolecular targets in, in CLL. And we have drugs that go after them. And that's, that's great. And, you know, it was, it was uh, really not too terribly long ago uh, that, that we had chemotherapy and chemotherapy only. Uh, that, was all we, that was all we had for, for CLL. And the BTK inhibitors have uh, really helped transform the space uh, such that nowadays we, we don't use much chemotherapy in CLL anymore. I mean, there, there's even debates as to whether or not uh, chemotherapy makes sense uh, amongst the, the sort of key, key thought leaders out there. Um, BTK inhibitors, the very first one approved was a Brutinib, great drug, super drug, it made enormous headway in, in the um, management of patients with CLL. We saw a Brutinib beat, uh, you know, effectively every chemoimmunotherapy it was put up against, it, it beat. And it's not really even chemotherapy, it's targeted treatment. It goes after the BTK enzyme. But the problem with BTK uh, and abrutinib, as you highlight, is there are a number of side effects. And if you're going to take a drug indefinitely, having small to mild to moderate side effects on a regular basis can be really discouraging for patients. And so with abrutinib, frequently those symptoms can be what we call arthralgias, sort of joint aches, um, uh, hand muscle cramps. People can get hand cramps, muscle cramps. I've seen it interfere with people's driving where they feel like they may even have to pull off the side of the road. Bruising can be problematic, particularly if patients are already on any form of anticoagulation. Um, the drugs were developed. And most of the studies excluded patients who were on Coumadin, um, but when patients are on aspirin or Plavix uh, for cardiac reasons or take direct oral anticoagulants for atrial fibrillation or, or other reasons, they can have really big problems with bruising. Um, we've seen that abrutinib gives rise to hypertension with time, and we can see atrial fibrillation develop as well. That's a cardiac arrhythmia. Then you got to put patients on on blood thinners, which, which can be a so problem. Just let me just yeah. stop you there for one sec. Uh, remind us what atrial fibrillation is, just a little more detail um, sure. on that and why that's important. Yeah, atrial fibrillation is 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 probably one of the topics that comes up quite frequently in this space, so it's it's worth the extra time. Um, atrial fibrillation is an irregular heartbeat. You know, if you think about your heart kind of going almost like a metronome, thump, thump, thump. atrial fibrillation can be unpredictable. It, some patients can have very rapid heart rates uh, that can make them symptomatic. Some people might not even know they have atrial fibrillation, but either way, it puts them at risk for uh, clotting complications uh, such as stroke, uh, heart attack, other blood clots that can happen. And so you, you have to put those patients on, on blood thinners. 
and um, you know, it's it's it for patients who have rapid atrial fibrillation, it can lead to shortness of breath, chest pain, emergency department visits, and and we see that if you leave patients on a brutinib for a sustained period of time, maybe by two, three, four years, that rate might be as high as say fifteen to twenty percent. So it's it's not a not a rare phenomena. Into that space, we've now seen two additional BTK inhibitors become available, acalabrutinib and zanubrutinib. And look, I think the key thing here is that's great. All these drugs can work for different patients in different set, uh, settings. And it may very well be, and we saw this with acalabrutinib first and secondly with xanabrutinib, that if you have side effects with abrutinib, you can change to one of the second generation, either acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib. And similarly, patients who have side effects from acalabrutinib may be able to transition to xanabrutinib and have fewer um, side effects or recurrent side effects. And so having therapies that are available for patients with fewer side effects obviously makes a huge, huge difference in their ability to take the medications long-term. And we know that inhibition of BTK is just centrally important to the long-term uh, disease control for patients with CLL. So what we've seen now in several head-to-head -head studies is that both acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib, when put head-to-head -head against ibrutinib, appear to have lower rates of atrial fibrillation. Uh, there may be lower rates of, of hypertension. Um, there may be higher rates of neutropenia with uh, xanabrutinib. That's a Remind low, us. Yeah, yeah that's ahead, absolutely. Yeah. That's a low healthy white blood cell count. Um, and that potentially leaves patients at risk for certain infectious complications. So we need to monitor that. Point is, there's some trade-offs between the drugs, but for the, some of the symptoms that bother patients, the joint aches, the hand pains, the hand cramps, even to some degree, the bruising and bleeding, that can be less on these second generation BTK inhibitors. And we've seen this now in head-to-head -head studies with acalabrutinib versus brutinib or xanabrutinib versus brutinib that, that patient tolerance appears to be better with the second generation BTK inhibitors. And this study you did looked at patients that had weren't able to tolerate mostly ibrutinib, but some acalabrutinib mm -hmm. patients too. I saw when I looked in that mm -hmm. and switched them to xanabrutinib. And did they did it remain as effective and were they able to better tolerate it? Uh, what was the experience in this study? The study wasn't designed to answer the question of comparative efficacy. Um, that's really more for the head-to-head -head studies. But what we saw um, was that for patients who stopped abrutinib or who stopped acalabrutinib for one reason or another, that symptom typically did not recur when you switch them to the novel uh, BTK inhibitor xanabrutinib, or if it did, it occurred with lower intensity, what we call lower grade. Um, so most patients who discontinued abrutinib, uh, um, that was the larger group of patients on the study, or um, uh, the patients who switched from acalabrutinib, um, just fewer fewer side effects and, and better able to tolerate it. And so, you know, it, the study wasn't designed to answer the question of comparative efficacy, but again, the pills only work if you take them, right? So um, we've seen that patients, um, even though the BTK inhibitors are designed to be started and then kept on indefinitely, patients are stopping their meds over time. And I think a lot of that has to do with side effects. So if we can reduce those side effects, the better off the patients are. Any final thoughts on the importance of this study, this class of drugs, and where xanabrutinib uh, may fit in? Um, you know, xanabrutinib is currently FDA approved in mantle cell lymphoma, Waldenstrom's, and, and not in CLL. However, um, uh, it is endorsed by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, uh, NCCN, for those patients who are intolerant of prior BTK inhibitors. However, we anticipate in the somewhat near term, I don't know the exact timelines, um, xanabrutinib will be available in CLL. And, um, you know, I think that, that having more options is great because if we see in other cancers that sometimes if, if, if one member of a drug class doesn't work, yeah, you just switch to another member of the drug class. And if that doesn't work, maybe you switch to another one. And this will allow us to have therapeutic options for our patients. And, 
you know, I think each doc will become comfortable with different ones. And, uh, you know, but having those options available is, is going to be great for patients. I think that, that we're still learning about BTK and uh, there will be additional drugs in the near term that may even work after these BTK inhibitors stop working. Um, and some of those are farther along and there's entirely new technologies being developed for how to continue to inhibit BTK even after those potentially stop working. So uh, BTK is centrally important and we got to learn how to maximize it. And part of maximizing it is minimizing side effects from therapy. Dr. Sharman, I always learn something when I talk with you. Thank you so much. And thanks for the research that you're doing. Brian, thanks so much for everything you do for the CLL patients. It's great to have you out there. And I, I, I send all my patients, you know, what, what's, what are the good mm -hmm. web pages? Uh -huh. Check out the CLL Society. So uh, you bet. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks.